Hello, this is Hmong. Can you hear me? Hi, this is Michelle. How are you? Hi, Hi this Michelle. Is Lakita. <laughs> is everybody on? Lakita? Yes. Hi, can oh, you? Great. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Let me minimize this and all right, I'm gonna change presenters. Okay. All right, Hmong, I gave you uh, control. Okay, I said show my screen, so let me know if you can see it now. Uh, says, yep, slide. there we go. Perfect. So, yeah, good. Okay, and all right. So, um, do you have any questions? No, I think I'm pretty clear. Um, I know I'll be driving the slides, which is perfect. Um, and just as far as the opening and then when we move to questions uh, at the end, so we have the opening slide here. Uh, so I'm, I am think, Lakita, you're kicking us off, right? Right. Um, so I will have my opening comments while this slide is up on the screen. Is that correct, perfect. Michelle? That is correct, yes. Okay. Perfect. So then when you give me the cue to hand, hand over to me, I'll go through the rest of the presentation. Uh, I have, I think, about 20 slides, give or take. Um, mm -hmm. And then I have a thank you slide, kind of which is the formal end of my presentation. And, and then I set the have a question uh, slide there. So after the thank you, should I just hand back to you, Lakita? And do you want to announce the questions or do you want me to I just do it? I think that's where Michelle will jump in, right, Michelle? Okay. Okay. Yes, and, then, and that's where I'll jump in and I okay. will change presenters. Um, and therefore, I will also be able to see what questions are asked. Okay. Um, I did ask Adria, if there are no questions, we wait about 15 seconds. And if nobody puts any questions in there at that point in time, we do end the webinar. Okay. okay. So um, if we have a lot of questions, sometimes it goes over, she said, and then sometimes, you know, we may end a little bit early depending. Okay. How long do you think the presentation is going to be at this point? Uh, about 40 minutes or so. Okay, That's perfect. Where I'm at. Yeah. Okay. Be about that. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. now that everything seems to be working on your end, and uh, Lakita, you're all set with the script. Um, yeah, and just one, just one other point of clarity. Sure. So after you go through the questions part, then you'll turn it back over to me for my concluding comments, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So I'll, you know, we'll just give it a little bit of time, and if I don't see anything come up, then that's when um, I'll say, okay. Uh, since there are no more questions, I'll hand it over to Lakita, and then you finish it off. Yep, yep. Okay, sounds good. And Himang, just a uh, one note to just make sure you check your mic because you you sound fine, but at times your voice goes down a little bit. So I just want to okay. point that out. Okay, so let me just check different head angles. So does this sound okay? Yes, that sounds good. That's very and, clear, yes. And how about now? Is this still clear? Th that one went down a little bit on me. <laughs> okay, all right. So it's when I'm looking down, so when I look at my notes. Now that's it. perfect right there. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you were doing. All right. Uh, I wonder why it's doing that with the head down. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I will... Uh, keep my head up. Is this still okay? Yeah, uh, that's perfect. That's strong. Okay, good. Perfect. Mm -hmm. good. All right. Okay, so I guess we drop off. Do we do we dial out or just no, minimize? No, no. Okay. Um, everybody will just stay. I mean, you can minimize it so you can do other things or end or mute. Remember how okay. I put that yep. mute that you can do. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll just all come back here at about three minutes till the actual seminar, or seminar, sorry about that, webinar begins. And uh, just so all three of us are back on, and then we'll go live at exactly 12. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is Ann, by the way. Sounds like you guys are, got everything covered. So perfect. Yeah, hi, Thank Ann. you, guys. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. We'll be back on three minutes. And, uh, till. 20 minutes. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay.
right, is everyone back now? Hello? Oh, there you go. Oh, I was just typing go. in the chat that I needed to be unmuted. Yeah, that's what I was doing too. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Um, I see that there's some people starting to join on, so I'm going to change my screen over to you. Perfect. All righty. Testing, just want to make sure you can hear me. Yes. I can, Lakita. Can you hear yeah. me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Very right. good. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Okay, we have four people on. I will begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lakita, and I am a volunteer with Philly SHRM Program Committee. On behalf of the Programming Committee and Philly SHRM, we would like to thank you for joining today's webinar entitled Leveraging Strategic Corporate Social Responsibility to Create Sustainable Impact on Society and Your Business. During today's presentation, if you have any questions, pl please feel free to send them via the question box of the GoToWebinar panel, and we will read them aloud to the speaker at the end of the webinar. We also want to remind you that you are eligible to receive one HRCI credit and one SHRM Professional Development credit for attending today's webinar. You will receive a follow-up email after today's webinar with a survey link that must be completed for you to receive the certificate for your credits. Once the survey has been completed, the credit forms will be emailed to you within one week. Also note, slides will be sent to all attendees after the webinar. So today's webinar will feature Himong Desai, Global Program Director at SAP Corporate Social Responsibility. Thank you for joining us today. I will now turn things over to Himong. Great, thank you so much, Lakita, for that introduction. Uh, Hello and good day everyone. I'm so excited to have this opportunity to speak with you all about strategic CSR or strategic corporate social responsibility and the benefits it brings to your business, society and the world at large. I'll start by telling you a little bit more about myself. Um, so my name is Himang Desai, uh, as Nikita already mentioned. I am part of SAP's global corporate social responsibility team and in my role, I'm the program director for our SAP Social Sabbatical portfolio, which is our portfolio of global pro bono volunteering offerings. We'll be talking a little bit more about pro bono volunteering later on in this presentation as well. I live right here in the Philadelphia area and I'm based out of our Newtown Square office, uh, which is also our American headquarters. As for my professional background, let me say I'm not a CSR lifer, if you will. Uh, I've been in this particular role for about a year now and previously worked in various regional and global marketing roles at SAP. In fact, my education, both my undergraduate studies at Drexel and my MBA at Penn State were both also in marketing as the common thread. 
However, I have a lot of experience with volunteering at SAP uh, for many years now through the different programs that have been offered. And I personally got a chance to participate in the social sabbatical myself uh, five years ago in Johannesburg, South Africa. So I spent four weeks there uh, working with a local nonprofit and acting as a business consultant trying to solve their key business challenges. I absolutely fell in love with the program, uh, continue to stay engaged with them by acting as a mentor for different teams, being a spokesperson uh, for the program and for our broader CSR work, and with helping with programs on a volunteer basis. And then last year, I had this chance to make a career change and formally join the team to run the program itself. Uh, outside of work, my wife and I, we run a small local nonprofit of our own called Ray of Hope International Foundation, which does work in healthcare education and empowerment causes in both India and the Philadelphia area. So philanthropy and corporate social responsibility are topics that I have had quite a bit of experience in, and I'm so thankful to have uh, CSR be my career now. Uh, one of the things that actually drew me to this role and to join the SAP CSR team is the fact that uh, looking at our strategic nature and focus of the approach we take to CSR. All right, so that's enough about me. Uh, let's get to the topic at hand and what we're going to cover in today's session. So today we'll talk about what exactly does CSR mean? Why do companies need to even practice CSR? Some key concepts which are very, very relevant to CSR and very important when it comes to practicing CSR, such as the idea of shared value, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, and the benefits of CSR all around, um, with a specific focus, of course, and breakdown on the business benefits that we'll take a look at. I'll use my experience at SAP as a case study to tie in key concepts of strategic CSR into the mix. So let's start with a quick definition of what does corporate social responsibility mean? Corporate social responsibility, in short CSR, so I'll just refer to the CSR going forward, is also sometimes referred to as corporate citizenship. And it has many different definitions. One that I think really covers it well is as follows. A business approach that contributes to sustainable development by delivering economic, social, and environmental benefits for all stakeholders. One thing to note is that while there is a CSR team at most companies, and I'm part of one at SAP, I believe that CSR does not really refer to just a particular team or initiative, but rather it is something that's in a company's DNA. And in order for this to happen, a critical component from the definition that I would like to really highlight is that it's a business approach. Two other key elements to focus on within the definition, the idea of sustainable development and the fact that the benefits are for all stakeholders. And as we look deeper at the overall impact of CSR programs and get into the elements of strategic CSR, I will come back and touch on these key points as well. Social responsibility can come in many different flavors and support many different causes. They do not need to be owned or uh, you know, lived within any given particular single team or organization. Especially when you look at a lot of these large companies, you know, as, an, again, as an example, SAP, we see that often initiatives that are demonstrating the company's higher purpose or, or vision are not all owned within the CSR team per se. But this is where the DNA aspect comes in. Um, and there are initiatives that SAP is passionate about, for example, within our diversity and inclusion efforts to have an inclusive workforce, our amazing Autism at Work program, and some of the partnerships that we drive with universities, educational institutions, and startup ventures that are not always owned within CSR. But they do really demonstrate the company's social responsibility. So case in point being, you know, I guess the key point I'm trying to get to here is CSR is not just a team, it's across the company, it's in everything that we do as a company, and it, that, that's how it should be uh, for most companies as well. 
Most important though, is that a company is not practicing CSR as a kind of a marketing gimmick or as a lip service. The focus must always be on social impact and only then I believe that the efforts will be truly successful and sustainable. So you might ask, that's all well and good, but why do companies need to be socially responsible? Isn't making a profit, turning a return on investment to investors, the ultimate goal of a for-profit business? And the answer to this really is, yes, while making a profit, return on investment for your shareholders is an important goal and cannot be ignored, companies are being asked to do more. And this ask is coming not from a single stakeholder, but really from all the key stakeholders. Let's start with the customers, right? Whether you are a business to business company, so I like SAP where you sell to other businesses, or you're a business to consumer company, like a consumer products uh, type of a company, customers want to buy from socially responsible and purpose-driven companies. To demonstrate that, there was a study done last year, it was a 2017 CSR study by Cone Communications, and they found that given similar price and quality, 89% of consumers say they are willing to switch brands to one associated with a good cause. While we can all argue you know, whether that number is more like 80% or it should be even higher at 95%, you know, the fact of the matter is 89 is a very high percentage of your consumers. So it's very important that we pay attention to that. Next, let's talk about our talent pool, our employees in general. Employees are increasingly demanding workplaces that demonstrate social purpose. You may have heard this kind of anecdotal statements about millennials, and we are starting to hear the same about Generation Z as well, which is a generation that follows the millennials. And this generation is just starting to enter the workforce now. But to demonstrate that, you know, a 2016 study on American millennials revealed that among American millennials, 75% would take a pay cut to work for a socially responsible company. 76% consider a company's social and environmental commitments before deciding whether they want to work there. And 64% actually would not take a job if the potential employer does not have strong corporate social responsibility practices. And mind you, millennials are projected to make up 50% of our population, uh, so 50% of our workforce, sorry, uh, by 2020, which is right around the corner at this point. So if they feel so strongly, you know, you would struggle to hire and retain talent uh, without focusing on this aspect. And finally, the investor group. Investors are really starting to hold companies accountable for their social engagement strategies as well. Many investors, both from an individual investor standpoint, but also institutional investors, are looking at companies' social responsibility activities before determining whether to invest in them. A case in point, there was a letter um, earlier this year, in the beginning of 2018, that was sent by Larry Fink, the chairman and CEO of investment company BlackRock, where he told the world's largest public companies that their contributions to society were now a requirement to receive BlackRock support and that all companies had to prove uh, really what they were doing to make a difference in society in addition to their core business and their you know, uh, kind of profit generating activities. So as you can see, all these different key stakeholders are demanding that companies think beyond just profit, but rather look at the bigger picture and contribute to the communities where they work. This is just an excerpt from the uh, letter that Larry Fink had said, where he said, society is demanding that, that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. Companies must benefit all of their stakeholders, including shareholders, employees, customers, and the communities in which they operate, with a spe special focus was on that communities in which they operate piece. So a common myth misconception is that, that corporate social responsibility is all about grant making, right? Or corporations handing out money to social causes. While there may be an element of that in what corporations do as part of their strategic CSR efforts, there's a very distinct difference. So I wanted to point that out here um, as, we, as we go forward. 
if the work of your company is focused mainly on financial contributions, it is not tied to your core business strategy or your core business itself, and there isn't much engagement kind of beyond the grants that are distributed, you're in essence doing corporate philanthropy and not strategic corporate social responsibility. Don't get me wrong here. There's nothing wrong with corporate philanthropy, but it is important to understand the difference between the two. Which then leads me to, when we talk about strategic CSR, what are some of the key aspects that we need to consider? First, you must leverage the core assets of your company. And one of the most important assets in any company are the people, the employees that we have, and they must be leveraged in various ways. Second, with strategic CSR, you're building partnerships and then participating in these partnerships. In essence, you're not doing something to someone, you're doing something with someone, right? And that's, how, that's the mentality we try to take when you think about strategic CSR and how you will advance communities as a whole. A very important point is about the strategic alignment to the business model and the business context. So as an example, uh, there's the CSR program run by Mondelez International, which is a well-known parent company of many uh, commonly known brands such as chocolate brands, Cadbury's and Milka, but also Kraft Foods as a pretty major one, where within this program, they send their employees to volunteer using their skills with cocoa farmers in Ghana. These cocoa farmers are the ones that feed feed the supply chains of some of their chocolate manufacturers as well. So the employees learn about the supply chain of the company, but on the other side, they can help skill up the farmers using their business skills. And that's how we create that win-win situation on both sides. Uh, these farmers then have more capacity, can build scale and can do better, not just for themselves, but for their community and in their work with the corporation. This is just one example of kind of taking a look at how to tie your CSR efforts into your core business. The result of such direct purposeful engagement is that companies can help create long-term sustainable impact in the communities. Uh, talking about sustainable development in the definition that we looked at a little bit earlier. The tie into business context helps provide additional benefits to the company as well which can allow for that sustained engagement with the, or, you know, with the nonprofit partners. An important piece I'll touch on here is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these are 17 goals um, that I have now succeeded the former Millennium Development Goals, which were eight of them, and have a couple of advantages over their predecessors. One is these 17 goals are truly global in nature, and I say this for two reasons. One is they are applicable to both emerging and developed countries, which makes them more universally accepted and actionable, so to speak. Second, they were agreed upon by world leaders from all 193 member states of the UN, which is almost never happened when it comes to that kind of unanimous agreement on any issue, let alone these big global issues that we deal with. Many companies have embraced these goals and taken on the challenge of furthering these. And from our perspective, you know, so have we at SAP, allowing us to focus on select sustainable development goals through specific programs and efforts and drive that really tangible and again, sustainable difference in furthering those particular goals. So I just talked about strategic CSR, kind of what are some of those key components that go into it? Now let's take a look from a real life example based upon the CSR strategy and focus at SAP. I'll try to demonstrate through this example how we have gone about incorporating those key elements of strategic CSR into our mission and programs. So just a little bit of background on SAP for those that may not be very familiar. Um, we were founded in Germany over 45 years ago. Uh, today, SAP is recognized as a global technology leader. Uh, we provide enterprise business software. Um, it powers the world's most recognizable 
businesses and is leading the transformation of the intelligent IT-driven world or the intelligent enterprise, as we call it. To provide some context, 77% uh, of the world's transaction revenue touches an SAP system and our customers produce more than 79% of the world's chocolate. Uh, this broad reach and customer base positions SAP uniquely to have that positive impact in the world. Uh, and that ties very nicely to our purpose as a company. So, you know, we understand now SAP drives global impact through our technology by transforming businesses and life, frankly, to solve the world's most complex and intractable problems. And we've been doing this for years, right, through our software and through the innovations in our technology. But as a global leader, SAP stands for a higher purpose that goes beyond this economic success and technological innovation. Our enduring purpose at SAP is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. It's why we do what we do. And that's why we support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and look to advance these goals and ensure prosperity for all. This purpose was adopted in, back in 2010. It was called our vision statement at the time. Um, and it really permeates throughout the organization. And I think that's an important part is when you think about your CSR strategy, this needs to be ingrained in the entire organization, right from the top, our CEO, all the way down to the employee base as well. So when we as SAP look to figure out, okay, what should our CSR strategy be? We have to look at the impact of technology on the world. And there's a lot of data on this slide, and the point is not necessarily get to caught up in what the statistics say, but really, what do they mean in the end? There's no argument. Technology is changing the way we work and live. If we kind of listen to the doomsday scenario, which I call it, which I call that, that you will hear, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, automation. These things are going to take away all the jobs. This affects obviously youth who will be entering the workforce, but also the current workforce that fears displacement. This is a huge issue. Technology plays a key role in transforming society. And we want to make sure that we don't stop innovating because we fear the loss of jobs from things like automation. Because without innovation, we're not going to be able to solve those big problems in the world. So while some jobs may be lost, a lot of new jobs can be created as well. And the key difference is that these new jobs would require a higher skill set specifically in the areas of STEM knowledge, so science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, there is a accepted, at this point, growing digital exclusion, a growing divide that is acceler accelerated by technology every day um, of people who do not have access to the digital economy. The World Bank report recently um, stated 60% of the world's population is excluded from the digital economy. One other statistic that is startling and also very close to my heart, since my daughter just entered elementary school, is that 65% of children entering primary school today will ultimately end up working in job types that don't exist yet. This came from the World Economic Forum last year. That is two out of every three five and six year olds that we are talking about here. So what we need to do is we need to join forces and ensure that people are prepared for these new jobs in the workforce appropriately. People are skilled to accept these technology-based roles as they move forward um, through their education. So our CSR mission, you know, looking at our internal factors, so our leadership commitment, purpose, but then looking at the bigger picture of the outside world and some of the statistics and the challenges that I talked about on the prior slide, you know, both of these come together and SAP as a result has chosen to focus on investing significantly in internal and external education, workforce readiness, because we believe a diverse, skilled and inclusive global workforce is critical to economic growth and our future success. 
Our CSR mission statement, which you see up there, powering opportunity through digital inclusion, really aims to close that gap of digital exclusion. But you might ask, you know, what is the business context more specifically? I talked about tying your CSR strategy and your focus to a business context. So really from a business perspective, right, when we talk about people being excluded from the digital economy, not being comfortable with technology or not having access to technology, you know, we need to ensure a couple of things, right? We need to ensure our customers have a talent pool equipped to run our solutions. We need to ensure that we have a diverse global pool of talent that is creating the next generation of software and technology solutions for our customers. And taking an even broader kind of worldview, we need to continue to spur economic growth because we can only do business within the context of the world that we live in. So if there's no growth in the world, there's less technology innovation, that has a very direct impact on our business in the future. So this is where, you know, focusing on education, more specifically digital literacy and digital inclusion become really, really key for SAP from a standpoint of how does this tie to our business? Taking our CSR mission and business context into account, you know, we kind of split up then our strategy into three pillars. Building digital skills, this includes all the education, digital literacy, training, and workforce readiness programs that we run. So these are the more direct um, impact to children, youth, and people who need to be reskilled, where we teach coding skills and, and other uh, soft skills from from business perspective. Uh, so programs like, we have a program called Africa Code Week that allows us to do that. Over half a million children were trained last year alone in Africa with coding skills, entry-level coding skills. Um, our second pillar is on accelerating best-run nonprofits and social enterprises. This pillar focuses on supporting organizations that are driving change in society and help them do that better. An example of this is programs like the Social Sabbatical, where we leverage our core assets, another key element of strategic CSR, our talent, to help build capacity and scale with these organizations, so nonprofits, social enterprises, you know, leaders who are driving social change. And finally, connecting employees with purpose. And this talks about really further leveraging our assets of the company, um, and we wanna leverage our employees to make that impact in society. We wanna provide them the opportunity to identify causes they can relate to and align with their own values and purpose. And one thing we chose to do is instead of focusing on all 17 goals through our CSR programs, we focus on three goals here that ties to our strategy uh, and ties to the bigger picture of digital inclusion, digital literacy. The goals are goal number four, quality education, goal eight, good jobs and economic growth, and goal 17, partnerships for the goal. So I hope this allows you to really see how we at SAP have you know, leveraged our core assets, chosen to focus on the topic with a close relationship to our business context as well. So speaking of um, employee purpose, let's take a look at the different types of volunteer offerings uh, that are out there and why a company might wanna choose and take a look at a mix of these for their employees. The most commonly understood kind of offering is the traditional employee volunteering. Uh, typically, these do not require any specialized skills or training and are anywhere from you know, an hour or a couple of hours long to an entire day, of course, with some exceptions that can be longer. Uh, common examples would be working at a food kitchen to serve a meal, building a playground, painting a community center or school. The next kind of volunteering offering is what we call skills-based, and this has been gaining popularity in recent years. Employees get to use their business skills as part of their volunteer work. Um, programs like Junior Achievement, uh, which is a very popular um, program with many corporates, uh, where they have the company program, as it's known, uh, where employees get to mentor students from local schools 
are a program where employees would get to teach a class or give career advice to young students. These are all examples of skills-based volunteering offer opportunities. And then finally, the third kind, uh, which is the most expensive and also the, you know, the most intensive, so to speak, is uh, pro bono volunteering. And this is, it is a kind of skills-based because employees are still leveraging uh, their key skills and talents and their professional expertise. But the key difference being employees work as consultants with local organizations to strengthen their operations while building their capacity for the future. So the social sabbatical that I mentioned and I have the privilege of leading is a pro bono volunteer offering um, and it looks to drive that sustainable impact. So these different offerings allow your employees to really have that choice of how, when, and where they wanna get involved and enable them to live their purpose accordingly. Another important concept to talk about is shared value, because this really drives and looks at how do you get to the business benefits of CSR. Um, shared value is an important concept because the core of strategic CSR is based on this idea of creating shared value. It is the idea of that win-win situation, you know, enhancing the competitive of, competitiveness of a company while advancing the economic and social conditions in the communities. In other words, it's really finding that sweet spot between business opportunities, how to leverage the corporate assets, and how to satisfy social needs. And this really builds into the idea of the triple impact of CSR programs that I wanted to share with you. There are very clear benefits for the community, participating employees, and the companies from CSR efforts and programs. For the communities, uh, pretty easy one there. They get to address key issues that they are facing. They get to leverage corporate talent, corporate partnerships to do so. Moreover, a lot of these partnerships can have a lasting impact on the community itself and can turn into long-term partnerships. And they may also have the opportunity to have access to financial support in some cases. So very clear you know, how CSR benefits the community. From the employee perspective, you know, again, it's a great opportunity for the employees to drive real meaningful change, kind of, as I said, be a change maker in society. Uh, no matter if it is a few hours uh, with a traditional volunteering project or a few weeks with a pro bono project, there is that feeling of accomplishment, satisfaction, and happiness that comes with, you know, volunteering. Additionally, getting these opportunities from the employers improves job satisfaction uh, and their view of their employer, but also helps broaden skill sets and their view of the world in the, in the larger context. And from a business standpoint, there are a number of benefits that go beyond, you know, CSR is enhancing your people and social investment strategy. So let's take a deeper look at that. So when we talk about the business benefits of CSR, let me first start by saying, you know, most companies do not practice CSR because they expect something back from it. The focus of CSR should always remain on the social impact in the communities. However, it is important to note that there are some benefits that do come back to the business and as a result of this kind of work. And in some ways, you know, these benefits really make it possible to sustain and even justify to some degree your CSR work, especially during lean times or hard economic times. So I've broken this out into three distinct categories. So let's take a look at the first one, which is the benefits to the brand. Of course, your CSR programs can help build a strong brand recognition. But I think what is really even almost more important than just brand recognition is the idea of strong brand differentiation. Uh, we talked about the statistic earlier about how a vast majority of consumers will switch brands to one that is associated with a good cause or a cause that they stand behind. Uh, in such a case, your, your brand will stand out. It is remembered by consumers, you know, when they're looking to make that difficult choice of purchase. Um, and it will be remembered even more so if it is looked at 
if you are looked at as a company that cares. Finally, from a branding perspective, you know, you it helps position a company as an employer of choice, which will allow you to attract and retain top talent, which is very, very important in today's day and age. Next, let's look at some of the operational benefits. And I, I term them operational benefits because it's really around the core operations of the business as well. Customers are actively seeking socially responsible companies to do business with. This applies not just again to consumer companies, but also in the business to business scenario where companies are looking for other companies with similar values to partner with and do business with. An aspect of this also comes down to, you know, customer loyalty. As an example, you know, customers are more likely to overlook a one-off occurrence um, and still stay with you and stay loyal to you if they have trust in your brand, trust in the values and trust in what you stand for as a company. There can be very direct operational cost savings that you experience from your efforts. Example, a very simple example being sustainability efforts that you take on you know, using energy efficient light fixtures uh, can reduce your utility bills, of course. You know, it's good for the environment, good for the business bottom line. Um, overall, these first two points lead to kind of that improved financial performance, which can help offset the cost of your CSR efforts. Your organization also gains insight from the different markets and sectors where you work. Uh, there is much to learn from the social sector in terms of efficiencies, operational simplicity, and so on, which can be very valuable. Also, going back to the example I used earlier with Mondelez and their employees getting the chance to be exposed to their supply chain, there's a lot of insight and knowledge that comes back, which can help further improve those types of processes uh, within a company that are just, you know, almost intangible benefits, so to speak, of, of such engagements. There was a study done again last year by the Boston College Center for Corporate Citizenship. Um, they call it their State of Corporate Citizenship, Citizenship Study, where they found that the majority of executive respondents across all business types and industries confirmed that corporate citizenship helped them successfully achieve business strategic goals ultimately improving performance. So they're not talking about just brand reputation or people feeling good about the brand or hiring talent. It's about a very direct achievement of strategic business goals and improvement of performance. And this is coming from executives from a cross industry, cross market uh, group of companies. And then finally, from an employee perspective, Needless to say, you have more engaged employees, which allows a company to attract the best talent and retain it longer. The branding aspect plays into that as well. Uh, the retention especially in turn also results in further operational cost savings for the business because of reduced cost and disruption of recruitment and training efforts. If I use an example from my program itself, you know, within the, so, within the group of social sabbatical participants, our surveys show that 86% are more motivated to perform in their work at SAP as a result of their experience. And finally, you know, your employees have a chance to develop their leadership and business skills, you know, broaden their horizons, become really better world citizens, all of which comes back to help their productivity, you know, innovative spirit, and also initiative within their business. One aspect that I consider core to the success of CSR programs is the element of partnerships. Uh, goal 17 within the Sustainable Development Goals is deemed, uh, is deemed partnerships for the goals and is the secret sauce to furthering all of the other goals as well. Really, no single company can achieve optimal impact through their CSR programs alone without any partnerships that they establish. And this is where tri-sector partnerships play in. Tri-sector partnerships, which is basically bringing together the public, private, and social sectors, bring the right expertise and resources together 
to help solve the biggest problems we face in the world. These partnerships are hard. They definitely take compromise. They need respect for the different perspectives, the different expertise, different goals and challenges that each sector has. But the results can really be extremely strong and can accelerate impact further. As Helen Keller rightly says, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. This is just a view as, as of a subset of global partnerships that we've established at SAP CS, within SAP CSR. And as you can see, these partnerships range from nonprofit organizations such as Pixar Global, the VR Family Foundation, and Junior Achievement, which I talked about earlier, to public sector organizations such as GIZ, the German government's international development body, uh, and so on. Additionally, we have partnered with a number of private sector companies, including our customers on programs like our Code Weeks, as well as the Social Sabbatical. These partnerships have really helped amplify the message and multi have that multiplier effect when it comes to social impact on the community. Another example of private sector partnerships is, the, is an initiative called Impact 2030 which is the only global private sector-led collaboration to activate employee volunteers to further the sustainable development goals. The focus of the initiative is on raising awareness across companies, the public sector, and social sector of the goals, but also to provide that platform for these cross-sector collaborations and deploy employee volunteer resources to have that scalable, scalability effect on impact. Impact 2030 has founding partners that include companies like Google, Dow Chemical, GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, uh, UPS, TD Bank, SAP, and so on. And these have provided opportunities for many multi-company collaborations, such as the recently launched Corporate Champions for Education program, which aims to bring employees from different companies together as pro bono consultants to drive digital literacy around the globe and particularly in emerging markets. So these types of examples of partnerships really can help improve impact, further the impact, and further the sustainable development goals uh, that we need to solve by 2030. With that, that is the end of my formal presentation. I want to thank you all for your time and attention, and I will now hand over to Michelle. Um, Michelle, take it away, please. Uh, thank you, Among. Uh, right now, we're going to open up for questions. If you have a question for our speaker, please type it into the question box at this time. Okay, there are no questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Lakita. Thank you. And thank you to Himang for taking time to share your knowledge with us today. Thank you to each of you for joining today's webinar. As a reminder, please look for the follow up email with the link to the survey. Be sure to complete the survey to receive HRCI and SHRM credits and visit www.phillysherm.org to register for up other upcoming events. We encourage you to regularly check out the Philly Sherm website for updates on all of our upcoming programs. Now on behalf of Philly Sherm, thank you again and enjoy your afternoon. Thank you so much everyone.